be prepared to cause them. And once they have grown to a visible size, they can be photographed. And this gives us a permanent record of the particle's paths. When you realize that you're looking there at a record of a particle that is only a million millionth the size of a pinhead, you'll appreciate the incredible ingenuity of the bubble chamber. Now, the paths of the particles, or as we call them, bubble chamber tracks, they're examined on a scan table uh, like this one. It's here that the uh, secrets of the particles are revealed. And the way it's done is that we, we examine these tracks and we measure them up, and the data is fed off into a, into a computer. And from the characteristics of the track, that one is able to infer just exactly what that particle was doing as it was going through the liquid. Well, what does it do, apart from make a track? Well, most of the time, it does nothing. The atoms of the liquid are mostly empty space, a tiny nucleus, which in hydrogen is a proton, surrounded by an even tinier electron. So the particle just coasts along and passes out the other end. Sometimes, however, the particle scores a direct hit on one of the protons. And then what usually happens is that the particle bounces away and sends the struck proton off in the opposite direction. This recoiling proton has enough energy of its own to create a track. And so we end up with two tracks instead of the original one. And this is just such a photograph. You see the, the track of the incoming particle on the right and the two outgoing ones on the left. Well, that's just a, a simple collision, uh, not very interesting, just to help us get used to the idea of looking at these uh, bubble chamber tracks. But there's something very much more interesting on the next photograph, so let's bring it up. But this time, we've got four tracks. Well, two of the tracks obviously correspond to the incoming particle and the recalling proton. But what are the two extra ones? Well, they have to be caused by particles of some kind, and they would be particles that were not present before the collision. So where do they come from? Well, when measurements are carried out on these tracks, it turns out that the energy carried by the four final particles is less than the energy of the incoming particle. We can arrive at this conclusion by uh, the characteristics of their tracks. Remember I said that there was a magnetic field on the bubble chamber? Well, the purpose of that is to curve the tracks, and the amount of curvature depends upon the electric charge carried by the particle and its momentum. And from its momentum, we can get its energy. But as I say, when you do this calculation, it turns out that you end up with less energy of motion after the, after the collision that, than you had to begin with that was brought in by the original particle. So, energy missing and two new particles created. Well, you've guessed it. What's happened is that some of that original energy of motion brought in by the particle in the accelerator has been transformed into the matter of the two new particles. It's an example of the interchangeability of energy and matter. We have an even more convincing uh, demonstration of that on the next photograph. Well, uh, straight away you'll see that it's a much more complicated picture than the previous one, so we'll have to take this in steps. Once again, the particle comes in from the right as it collides with one of the protons in the liquid, it produces one, two, three, four, five, six tracks. In other words, four new particles. But uh, having said that, you'll notice that we haven't yet accounted for all the tracks on the picture. And the reason is that, as well as the production of four new particles, a pulse of light is also created. You can't see it on the photograph because light does not leave a track in the bubble chamber. But in point of fact, the light crosses over to there and transforms itself into two new particles. One is an electron, 
and the other is a positively charged electron called a positron. Now, this is a, an example of the transformation of pure energy, pure electromagnetic energy of the light pulse into matter. Right now, what happens to these two new electrons? Well, the negatively charged one goes spiraling off into the distance, gradually losing energy to the liquid until eventually the electron stops. But meanwhile, what's happening to the positron? Well, it starts off in its characteristic spiral, but then it hits one of the atomic electrons belonging to the liquid and transforms back into light. So that's the kind of thing that happens here. Uh, with the bubble chamber technique and with other techniques, we can investigate this interchangeability of matter and energy. And all these uh, interchanges are taking place uh, according to Einstein's equation E equals mc squared. Right, well, there's one final point that I want to make, and that concerns the exchange rate. How much energy is required to produce a certain amount of matter, and vice versa? Well, I can illustrate that in the following way. Suppose that coin were made from positrons. And this one is from ordinary electrons. Suppose we brought the positrons and the electrons together so that they could annihilate in the way that we've been seeing in the bubble chamber picture. Uh, how much energy would we get out of that? Well, the answer is the equivalent of 40,000 barrels of oil, which is pretty staggering. And that, in fact, explains uh, the enormous power that we get from nuclear power stations and from uh, nuclear bombs. Those are processes which give rise to uh, very uh, efficient uh, changing of matter into energy. It also explains why CERN requires those enormous accelerators to produce even these tiny bits of matter on these photographs. catching.